Welcome everyone to my presentation on an analysis of a gradient damage model coupled with plasticity exhibiting isotropic and kinematic hardening. My name is Aris Zagmarkis and I'm from the Technical University in Darmstadt. I would like to start the presentation with a brief introduction to continuum damage mechanics and in particular to phase field models in the context of fracture mechanics. So generally, in fracture mechanics, a realistic description of material behavior requires the modeling of softening in the uniaxial stress strain curve of the material. And for that purpose, continuum damage mechanics offer an appropriate framework, especially in the case of ductile materials. However, the problem that arises when softening is modeled is that the ellipticity of the boundary value problem is lost and numerical difficulties can arise. One possibility to overcome this problem is to introduce regularizing terms in the material model. And this can either be done by regularizing the damage variable itself so that the gradient damage model is introduced or this can be achieved in terms of the phase field approach where the crack topology is regularized as it can be seen here on the right side. In the upper picture a sharp crack topology as it is known from classical fracture mechanics is shown and in the lower picture the same crack topology is smeared over an area depending on an internal length scale denoted by L. After this short introduction I want to address the following points in this presentation. First, plasticity model is introduced and extended to include damage effects. Then the damage law for the material model is introduced and we will then move over to some numerical investigations. In the end, a conclusion and an outlook will be given as usual. So, the plasticity model used in this work is a simple von Mises plasticity model with isotropic and kinematic hardening behavior and we assume, as usual, the additive decomposition of the strain into elastic and plastic parts, as well as the additive decomposition of the free energy density per unit volume into elastic and plastic parts due to isotropic and kinematic hardening, respectively. And for later purposes, we want to denote the sum of uh, free energy density in an undamaged material by uh, introducing the upper index of zero. We have the von Mises yield function with the Cauchy stress sigma, the back stress tensor due to kinematic hardening, the increase in the uh, radius of the yield locus due to isotropic hardening, and the initial yield radius. We assume an associated normality rule for the evolution equation of the plastic strain uh, with the plastic multiplier lambda and we assume that the kuhn tucker conditions and the consistency condition hold. To generalize now this plasticity model to include damage effects, we introduce an isotropic damage variable d, which takes values between 0 and 1, 0 denoting a completely undamaged material state and 1 denoting a fully damaged material state. And one possible approach to generalize the model is to assume that the damage variable or that the damage will have an influence on all of the previously introduced terms of the free energy density, as well as that there will be a new term of free energy density uh, due to damage accumulation. And the latter shall depend on the damage variable itself, as well as the gradient of the damage variable. The influence on the first three terms can be captured in terms of a so-called degradation function, which is often assumed to be of a quad quadratic form. And for the last term, the phase field approach is used where the following form of the free energy density is assumed, which results from the regularization of the crack topology. And we have here a material parameter for the fracture toughness, as well as the internal length L. For the sake of completeness, we need to generalize our yield function as well, and for that purpose, the same degradation function as before is included in our von Mises yield function. Next, we move over to introduce the damage law for our material model, and for that purpose, we need to evaluate the thermodynamic consistency of our material model. It should be noted that in general, whenever gradients of state variables are included in the material model, uh, 
standard thermodynamics are not the appropriate framework to address thermodynamic consistency. Therefore, in the current work, thermodynamic consistency is established with the non-standard thermodynamics proposed by Dunn and Serin in 1986. And the main idea of this approach is that the heat flux vector Q introduced in the first law of thermodynamics is extended by an additional energy flux vector Q prime, which is assumed to capture the non-local effects introduced by the gradient terms. And with this addition, the second law of thermodynamics for isothermal processes with homogeneous temperature distribution, or as it is also known, the clausius duhem inequality, takes the following form, where we have the stress power, as well as the time derivative of the free energy density, and now an additional divergence term. Using standard arguments of thermodynamics, we finally get to the dissipation inequality due to damage evolution, where we have the so-called variational derivative of the free energy density with respect to the damage variable, as well as the time derivative of the uh, damage variable itself. And it can therefore be concluded from this inequality that this negative of the variational derivative is the so-called thermodynamic driving force for damage evolution. Based on this driving force, we can now introduce a damage criterion, which takes now the form as shown here, with the undamaged parts of the elastic plastic free energy density, the derivative of the degradation function with respect to the damage variable, as well as the Laplace operator here in, on the right side. And this damage criterion is the exact equivalent to the yield surface in the classical plasticity theory, and we have some more parallels as well. Uh, we have a damage evolution equation, which is similar to the associated normality rule in plasticity theory, and we assume again that the kuhn tucker conditions and the consistency condition hold during unloading, loading and unloading. Up until now, no distinction has been made between tensile and compressive loadings, and for this purpose, the following split into volumetric and deviatoric parts is introduced. The split is based on the decomposition of compressive and tensile contributions to the free energy density based on the sign of the trace of the uh, strain tensor. And with this split, uh, the damage criterion can be modified slightly so that only the tensile contributions of the free energy density are included in the damage criterion. With this material model now at hand, we move over to the numerical investigations, uh, which were performed in the uh, finite element framework. For this purpose, the damage variable is introduced as an additional degree of freedom in the model. And the implementation in Abacus here is based on a staggered algorithm. That means that the displacement problem and the phase field problem are solved independently from another. First, the phase field is held constant and the displacement uh, field problem is solved and in the second step the displacement is held constant and the phase field problem is solved and the two steps alternate up until uh, convergence is achieved in the respective time increment. And for the purpose of analysis for the present work we will compare in the following results only pure linear isotropic hardening and pure linear kinematic hardening. The first example that will be discussed is that of uniaxial tension and compression. On the right side we see a simplified version of the geometry and displacement controlled cyclic loading conditions are applied. The material parameters are shown on the left and in particular the hardening parameters for the isotropic and kinematic hardening responses are chosen in that way that the monotonic uniaxial stress strain curves are identical for both types of hardening. This can now be seen on the right side, where the stress strain curves for both types of hardening are shown in the case that no damage is included in the material model and for one loading cycle. We can see that during the first loading branch, both types of hardening have the identical uh, stress strain curve. And when unloading and reloading again, in the case of kinematic hardening, a closed hysteresis loop is obtained, whereas in the case of isotropic hardening, the stress strain curves widens 
If damage is now included in the material model and multiple loading cycles are applied, the picture changes as follows. We can see that for isotropic hardening, damage accumulation occurs in every applied loading cycle and the stress drain curve approaches a nearly elastic uh, response uh, in the end. Whereas for kinematic hardening, damage accumulation occurs only during the first loading branch and after that the material response is completely elastic plastic so that the same hysteresis loops as in the undamaged case are obtained. And to understand these very different types of uh, material behavior, we have to look again at our damage criterion. And we can notice here that whether damage accumulates or not depends mainly on this tensile contribution of the elastic plastic free energy, free energy density. And in the case of pure isotropic hardening, the respective parts in the free energy density are increasing always monotonically, since this C plastic isotropic depends only on the accumulated plastic strain. Whereas in the case of the kinematic hardening, the respective part of the free energy density can decrease or will decrease if unloading occurs, since it depends on the plastic strain itself. These observations from the uniaxial case will now help to understand the material behavior in a more complex example that is a cracked plate under plane strain conditions. On the right side the model geometry is shown and again displacement controlled cyclic loading conditions are applied. This time a positive mean value in the applied loading is chosen. If we examine now the damage distribution in the model after 1 and after 10 loading cycles, we can see that for the kinematic hardening case on the left side, damage distribution after one loading cycle is limited to a very small area around the crack tip with a very small value of the damage variable as well. And after 10 loading cycles, the exact same damage distribution is obtained. For the isotropic hardening, on the other hand, damage distribution after one and after 10 loading cycles uh, differ very much from another and especially after 10 loading cycles it can be seen that a remarkable crack propagation uh, has been modeled with this type of hardening. It can therefore be concluded that crack propagation due to cyclic loading can only be modeled by isotropic hardening with the present model and this is not possible at all if pure kinematic hardening is assumed. It should be mentioned however that it is known from, from uh, classical plasticity theory that isotropic hardening, and in particular linear isotropic hardening, is not appropriate to capture adequately the effects of cyclic plasticity. Kinematic hardening is a much better assumption for this purpose. To overcome the shortcomings of uh, the presented model, one possible solution is to incorporate the accumulated plastic strain rate in the damage evolution equation, so that uh, plastic deformation is always accompanied by damage evolution. And the second topic for future works is to include a cycle skipping technique, for example, in the material model, so that higher numbers of loading cycles can be calculated. Thank you very much for your attention.